from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Rivers from the Music Division, and it is my very great pleasure this evening to introduce John Newsom, who will uh, moderate our discussion. Uh, many of you may know John already because he is um, a very familiar face to us around the library. He began his career in the Music Division in 1966 as a reference specialist, and he retired uh, 40 years later. 38. 38 <laughs> years later uh, as the chief of the division. And um, John made a very, um, was a, a distinguished leader for us in this institution, but also in the arts world. So we are very pleased to have him here tonight. Um, he has uh, been around the commissioning activities of the music division uh, for his tenure in the music division and he uh, certainly was very actively involved in all of the Kusevitsky activities and even remembers Olga Kusevitsky herself. So welcome, Thank you, John. Kate. Thank you. Let me uh, introduce you to other panelists, Fred Lairdahl, uh, who is a composer and very good one because we commissioned him to write a piece. <laughs> uh, and he is a, he's a professor, uh, he's the Fritz Schreiner Professor of Music Composition at Columbia University, and his writings on mu musical cognition have been very important. Uh, so he is, say, not a theorist so much as someone who is interested in how we hear and, and how it works. Uh, he has also have been a member of the National Academy of, of Arts and Letters for a number of years, and he is a, perhaps the longest standing, except for Gunther, member of the Kusevitsky Foundation Board of Directors. Uh, Fred Sherry, who is going to perform this evening, is a no, noted cellist whose passion for new music has made him one of the great champions of contemporary music. He is a great virtuoso and he has dedicated his life to new music and you will hear him play some very great pieces of new music this evening. And on my left, Jim Kendrick, uh, who is really a multi-instrumentalist. He deals with those instruments that the legal profession has to deal with, but also has been an oboist and is both a musician and a very prominent man in the music scene. He has uh, been very active in the music publishing business, served for years as the CEO of Boozy and Hawks, uh, is a director of ASCAP, and also serves as secretary and director of the Aaron Copeland Fund for Music. So. We are ready to answer questions, but first I thought I'd start things with a few thoughts about who Kusevitsky was. He's not a household word. More people probably know him today as the man who's either whose name appears at the top of some of the greatest pieces written in the 20th century, or perhaps uh, for the, the name of his wife, who and when he first set his foundation up in 1942, dedicated the pieces commissioned uh, to his, who his wife, Natalia. Natalia was a very important part of his life. Uh, she was the heiress of one of the most fabulous tea fortunes in Russia. Uh, her father, uh, Konstantin Ushkov, was a, a head of a tea firm that according to one of Kusevitsky's biographers, grossed in 196 something like 38 million rubles, which would be 19 million dollars in 196 terms and close to 2 billion in our terms. So when he married her in 1905, he was able to change his life from that of being a, a superb but a lowly orchestral musician as a double bass player and take on the challenges of supporting new music uh, which have changed music in the 20th century. Uh, for a couple of years, he went to Berlin before the revolution in 1908. 
He was already not only concertizing as a double bass virtuoso, but he was conducting. And a very important witness to his <coughs> progress was Arthur Nikisch, the great conductor whom he admired above all. And Nikisch said in 1910, I am astounded at how rapidly this man has learned how to be a real master of the orchestra. He is the best young conductor alive. And that helped establish that Kusevitsky was not just a gifted amateur whose money enabled him to buy orchestras and show off. He was a genius and one of the great conductors. Our celebration of Kusevitsky, however, is based on his philanthropic, philanthropic work. Uh, with the money he had, he, as early as 1909 in Berlin, uh, set up two very important institutions. One of them was a publishing house called Edition Russe, the purpose of which was to support new music, including that of his friend Alexander Skryabin, also the young Stravinsky, and at the same time he set up a foundation for commissioning new music, which didn't continue forever because there were many horrible interruptions in the 20th century uh, that prevented the con continuity of that foundation. But he set it up with $250,000 of money then to commission new music. And that was clearly his vision at that very early stage of his career. And he, he goes on uh, with all of us through the activities of the foundation the Kusevitsky Foundation that he set up in 1942 in memory of his late wife, Natalie. Any thoughts? And one might add to that, of course, that he was the conductor of the Boston Symphony for many years and, and a very distinguished conductor who commissioned all kinds of American composers. It was this uh, kind of golden age in, in American composition where a major orchestra was constantly commissioning and performing works by Copeland, Roy Harris, uh, on and on. Walter Piston, of course. Yes. Uh, there's a famous story that Copeland loves to tell about when Copeland was still a young student with Nadia Boulanger. And Miss Boulanger said, we must go visit this man, Sayers Kusevitsky. And they did. Kus uh, Kusevitsky heard Copeland play with Prokofiev looming over them, <laughs> uh, his Grogue ballet suite. Uh, Prokofiev had some caustic comments to make about it, but uh, it was an Im Im amazingly important moment for not only Aaron Copeland, but I think for American music, because on the spot, Kusevitsky said, I will play your music. He had just been appointed to the uh, directorship of the Boston Symphony. So Copeland got this incredibly great start, and uh, it mean, Copeland's Third Symphony came out of all this, Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. The very young Benjamin Britten, who is Peter Grimes, came from Kusevitsky. And other extraordinary pieces we don't necessarily associate with Kusevitsky, such as Ravel's orchestration of the pictures at an exhibition. That wouldn't have happened without Kusevitsky, who got the rights to publish it and exclusive performance rights. But his mark is everywhere on the music of the 20th century. Yeah, John, I was thinking of something because one of the earlier composers commissioned was Lucas Foss, and the Capriccio for Cello and Piano, was, which was written in 46, is dedicated to Natalie Kusevitsky. Here comes Gunther. Gunther. Yeah. Hooray! Hooray! Can we get, can you come to the stage, Gunther? If you want, like, you can stay right here and you can yeah, yeah. have a mic. Gunther, hey. Here, I'll give you mine and I'll yeah. take this one. So what am I supposed to say? Anything I, <laughs> after all. I, I thought you had been sent to someone. Yeah. Yes, we were. I was were. talking about Lucas, Lucas Foss and, and Kusevitsky, and you might remember the story because Lucas was very fond of telling it, but that when, when Kusevitsky uh, did first, for the first time did the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, yeah. the young Lucas Foss went up to Bartok and said, you know, you ended in the wrong key. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and yeah. everybody was kind of shocked, but actually then now there's another ending to the yeah. Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, which you already, probably... You already mentioned that that was the first commission. 
Yes. Of the foundation. John just mentioned and, that. Yes. And Bartha had a thousand dollars. Yes, <laughs> they weren't big, but they were but important. He, he was broke, and he was in this country, and and uh, everybody suddenly discovered him. I I, I had heard. I, I think that what was the big uh, chamber ensemble piece for Celesta and uh, music, music for strings, percussion, and Celesta. Yeah. So that that. Uh, that, was, that came before, and boy, that was considered unplayable. And in <laughs> fact, at the very end of it, there are some tempo markings that I wondered about. Something that's like 240, and it should be like 120. Oh, yes. But uh, 60 years later, I finally managed to do it at his temple with the Pro Arte Orchestra. We nearly went crazy. Yes. <laughs> but, but anyway, the Concerto Grosso. That, that was the big breakthrough piece. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. So we've been in existence that long. <laughs> yeah. Kuskovitsky had an enormous courage because he was writing, he was commissioning music that nobody could say exactly how it was going to turn out, but he had to learn very difficult scores. The idea that he could ever have been in any sense amateurish uh, or that he was reliant on Nicholas Slidemski or others to play the piano part of the score for him. Yeah. He studied those scores. He learned the rite of spring when other conductors were afraid to, to uh, touch it. And he did there were remarkably courageous yeah. things, such as his presentation, I think it was in London, of Stravinsky's great uh, P symphony of wind instruments. Uh, he was crazy as, as a programmer sometimes, and people sometimes thought he was a little too crazy. But he took big risks, and he was extremely courageous in presenting this music. A little bit of an off, off, off the track topic, Mrs. Coolidge was also one who commissioned people that, that nobody would touch in those days. Both the Schoenberg third and fourth quartets were her Yes, her absolutely, and she took them home because she didn't understand them. She actually took them home and tried to figure out what kind of music it was. I don't know if she liked them very much, but she didn't, did, did, did not deter her from believing in the, in the Schoenberg. And let's put in one more good word for Mrs. Whittall. Mrs. Whittall loved Verklärte Nacht, and she thought anybody who could write such a piece was okay, no matter what he did was okay. <laughs> so she bought all of Schoenberg's string quartets, including the D minor one, the Opus Zero, and the other four quartets, and Fairclair to Nock, and I think Piero Lunaire. And between Coolidge and Whittall, who's Mrs. Whittall, who's Romeo are seated in, uh, there was more support for Schoenberg, I think, than anywhere else in the United States. Going back for a second to uh, Kusevitsky's relationship with Aaron Copeland, uh, after that uh, famous meeting that was described, he programmed his uh, first symphony. And uh, when it came to the performance, the story goes that uh, he turned to the audience and said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, piece was written by a man of 25. By the age of 30, he'll be ready to commit murder. <laughs> yes. Well, now, of course, Copeland didn't commit murder, but he, what he did do was form a very long association with Kusevitsky, which uh, extended to Kusevitsky's founding of Tanglewood. Uh, yeah. And Copeland was the first uh, director of the of the composition program. Was there uh, associated with Tanglewood practically to the end of his life. And many of the great composers of that era, uh, including Leonard Bernstein, with whom Kusevitsky also had a very important relationship with, uh, Lucas Foss, Irving Fine, many many others, uh, passed through that institution. Another example of Kusevitsky's legacy. Um, I just jotted down, you know, almost at random. Uh, a tiny sampling of the composers who have been commissioned by the Kusevitsky Foundation over its now 72 years. And in the only order being alphabetical and with apologies to the hundreds of, of equally worthy composers, they include John Adams, Samuel Barber, Luciano Berrio, Leonard Bernstein, Harrison Burtwistle, John Cage, Carlos Chavez, Lucas Foss, Jörg Ligeti, Steve Reich, Gunther Schuller, uh, Karl Heinz Stockhaus and Igor Stravinsky, Michael Tippett, Edgar Perez, and William Walton. And one of the most amazing things about this incredible list, and as I said, it goes on and on well beyond just those names that I mentioned, is that one of the conditions of a uh, Kusevitsky commission is that the manuscript score is deposited here at the Library of Congress, something that, that Kusevitsky himself 
wanted to do because of his close relationship uh, that he established with the library starting in 1950. And imagine me, a, gra a, f a recent graduate student coming to work as a reference librarian here, being able to go to the shelves of the original manuscripts of the pieces I had studied for years, uh, the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra and so many others that, that Jim has just mentioned. It's a, it's a wonderful library resource as well as a gift to the world. Gunther, when did you start at Tanglewood? I got there in 1963. Uh, Leinsdorf invited me uh, and I spent 25 years there. Yeah. And wonderful years, but my goodness. Incredible. I wanted to mention, just then with your list, you know, if someone had only commissioned the Symphony of Psalms of Stravinsky, that would be already fantastic, because that's one of the really remarkable great pieces there. Yeah, I spent uh, many happy years there. And of course, Aaron invited me already before I became his successor, you know, and, and we talked about jazz and modern opera. He had already written a, a few and, and Mio had and uh, little operas. So, uh, you know, I, I became eventually the sort of artistic director of the first, I just was the composition teacher, but I kind of took over the place. <laughs> yeah, as a composer and, and conductor and so on. My goodness, I I have not yet written about my happy years at Tanglewood. Um, they'll be in my, the second volume of my autobiography. I haven't gotten around to that yet. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And of course, the location. I mean, everything about it is just incredible. Yeah. And to conduct on that stage, the shed, you know, and everything except when thunderstorms came. <laughs> <laughs> Always interesting when the thunderstorms came. Right. Yeah. Do, do yeah. we have anyone who would like to ask questions? You've got a golden opportunity here. This way. <coughs> oh, sorry. Thank, thank you. For, first, a comment. Um, I haven't, I remember about 20 years ago, uh, consulting a, a wonderful list, beautifully uh, uh, typeset on computer font, that listed the Kusevitsky commissions from about 51 through 76. And I can't remember whether I might have picked it up here at the library or if it was on online. And I it is online. It, 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 there, it is online. There okay. is a Kusevitsky.org website, which is the website of the foundations okay. and. There are lists of commissions there. And it's been updated through? Yeah. Through, OK. Mm -hmm. Then the, the, the question is, um, I, I, I know Fred Sherry and, and uh, Ms. Oppens and a lot of the composers here, Mr. Schuler and, and Fred, you, uh, Mr. Lerdahl, Dr. Lerdahl, you all had works uh, performed in 1976 when it was after Kusevitsky and after Bernstein's long tenures. It's when Boulez was at the, the New York Philharmonic, but there was the first annual contemporary music celebration with the New York Philharmonic and the Juilliard School, and it was two two weeks or so, and it had a lot of music um, in both Avery Fisher Hall and and Alice Tully Hall, and uh, it there, I don't believe there was ever a second one. And does anyone have any knowledge as to to why that nexus? Then, then continue after 76. Thank you. Jacob Druckmann um, did the Horizon series in the early 80s, I think 83, something like that. He did it for two, two seasons. So he, he tried to revive that on a somewhat smaller scale than, than Boulez did. Um, now there's a, a composer in residence with the New York Philharmonic, who they, and they do readings of young composers and so on. So, it, But uh, something on the scale that you're talking about, I, I don't think is, has been with the New York Philharmonic. It wasn't a reading program. It, it had yeah. Maxwell Day. No, it, wa it wasn't. I actually played in that, and, and it was a, a very fully developed program. But it's one of those things you have to have the will and the funding. And, yeah. yeah. I, I'd like to. Oh, back there. And then. 
I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Schuller. I, I met you briefly a long time ago at Peabody when you visited Peabody Conservatory many years ago. And I wondered if you had ever completed the Bop book, your third in the history of jazz, or the what? what? Your third jazz book after oh, yeah. the age after of After the swing era, you were working on the Bop? Oh, you would ask that question, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also got to write the second volume of my autobiography. Look, just wish me good health, and I will do all these things. Right now, I'm, 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 I've been involved with an avalanche of commissions, 20 commissions, that have, which I've already written 15. And since I still have to make some money, I'm concentrating mostly on writing music because when I write books, I, I mean, I'm losing money. Well, your, your, book, so your, book on early jazz, your book on early jazz is one of the great but iconic books on, on jazz. Yeah. Well, I, I hope to live long enough to do all of this, and I think I will. <laughs> yes. Um, just, uh, I'm just uh, always in interested, in, it went through my mind today when I was looking at the program, oh, all these new music composers, but this is like 100 years later. And I, d I wondered, uh, looking back at your work and the Kusevitsky Foundation work, how did you all come about to learn which composer to support? Uh, what, did they apply, yeah, that's a good oh, that's or? A good <laughs> yeah. And I didn't hear Charles Ives on that list, so oh, I. Uh, he, was, he had passed by 1954 and had stopped writing music in the early 20s, so um, there wasn't that possibility. There is absolutely a, a, an application process, quite a thorough one. Um, I don't remember how long ago it was, but there's a, uh, a requirement now that we, we have a, in effect, a co-commissioner. They don't necessarily have to put up money but we want to be sure that the pieces will be performed. So we take applications from, uh, from performing groups that sponsor the commission project, and they commit to doing the performances of the works that we, that we fund. Uh, it's a very thorough screening process. Uh, our board consists of uh, virtually all very, very high-level uh, composers and performers. Uh, we will sit down uh, in the very near future, <laughs> uh, like tomorrow, and uh, go through this year's submissions and um, uh, listen and read scores and look and debate and vote and th that's the process. I thought that your question was actually that how do you come by the expertise to know which ones are the good ones? But when you look around and see the composers that are here and out there, it's, it's a pretty high level group, people that really can read music and have deep, vast experience, not only with young composers, but with the old composers as well. I, I, it, it, at the risk of embarrassing people, perhaps the other members of the board uh, would stand up for a moment who are, who are here. Uh, Ollie, Ollie Wilson. Ollie. Uh, Steve uh, Stucky, Ursa Oppen. Uh, together with, with, with Fred and, and uh, Gunther and, and Fred Lerdahl. Uh, you know, you don't get a better panel than that. And we have fun. I didn't, know, I didn't know that because of the difficulties in the 20th century with the wars, if there was some emphasis in encouraging uh, refugees, that, uh, musicians that were coming over from Europe and that sort of thing. Well, I think they, there was during World War II, and, and sure. the Bartok and Charter for Orchestra is a prime example. Absolutely. But, but uh, since then, uh, and so to more a certain extent as well, given the timing of when he did Peter Grimes and why he was in America to do it. Well, but yes, that's certainly true. I might also mention that we get a, a great help from the staff of the Library of Con Music oh, Division oh, of the yes. Library of Congress. Oh, okay. yes. Okay. Couldn't do it without it. Fantastic. Yeah. Other questions? Or just topics for conversation? Yes. What do people want to... What, what are people, what are you all listening you to, to yes. on your, in your free time? <laughs> Maybe you could talk about um, your experiences with some of the composers who've been chosen and what it's like to work with them. Oh, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> right, that's <laughs> who wants to touch that one? Uh, well, I've, yeah, I've been involved in many, in many premieres. Uh, <laughs> that would be a, sort of a self-serving comment, and also I would have to admit that when you're playing a brand new piece of music that nobody has seen before except for you and the composer, that there are times, sorry Fred, <laughs> there are times when 
say, you know, I really want to sound good on this piece, so I'm going to change this little bit ever so slightly. And then I wait for the composer to tell me, uh, you changed my thing, I don't like that. And then <laughs> if they don't say anything, then I just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we would only have contact with any, when it's chamber music, we wouldn't have any, when it's orchestral music, yes. you know, the board. And, and there have been times when people have been coerced into completing their commissions, which have been overdue. Oh, yeah. We've had those, well, one of us uh, volunteers to call Mr. or Miss X and say, please finish your piece. Yeah, well, there have been four or five that never were done, I yes. think, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah, for crazy reasons. But we, we, we're, we're pretty lenient when the cause is death. Other than that, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes? Can you comment on his, uh, his youth and his early career in Russia and what impact that had on his life as a, as a composer and musician? Hmm. Yeah. Well, well uh, I can, I'd love to do that because I'm a great Scriabin fan, and Kosovitsky, his first commission was the poem of ecstasy. Uh, even before, when, when his wife, who was very wealthy, she just, it was a, wasn't even a foundation, but he gave a commission. And I think even the other great masterpiece of late Scriabin, Prometheus, mm -hmm. both of us would not have, have happened. Well, Scriabin would have written them, but anyway, uh, that was Kosovitsky's first commissions around the time that he did the tours on the Volga yeah. River. Yes. Yeah. Skriabin accompanied uh, uh, Kosovitsky on his Volga tours. He took, took, took the orchestra down to smaller towns that didn't have music of any kind. Yeah. And they did classical works and they did Skriabin. Uh, and it, these were very uh, well received. They were famous. They this is in 1909, you know, yes. that, that early. Yeah, well, there's, there's another interesting thing about the Russian history because you could think of the early part of the 19th century as the poets and the writers. There was Gogol and Pushkin and uh, Lermontov and so many other the really great ones came. And then following that came all the composers, Borodin and Mussorgsky and Tchaikovsky, and then it went on into Scriabin and Stravinsky. And then, then it came that time when kind of the painters took over. There was Goncharova and, and many of the ones that were the earliest painters of the, of the Russian Revolution. And I, I was lucky to go to Moscow and see the exhibition of those early uh, communist paintings. And they're great, truly great. Yeah. Kusevitsky was so esteemed that even under the uh, Soviets, uh, they wanted him to stay. And, and they could have done the things that Soviet people often do to other people that don't agree with them. Kusevitsky was courageously outspoken in not liking the Bolsheviks, and he was persuaded to stay on until 1920 when he finally just couldn't take it any longer. But he was highly regarded in Russia by the Soviets. At that, at that period, they were very much into promoting new art. They hadn't yet gotten into this social realism business. Yes. very evident as you speak, but I think it's nonetheless uh, worthy of uh, mentioning specifically, and that is that the Kusevitsky Foundation is, at least in my experience of what I know, probably the only or one of the very few foundations in this country that supports uh, the creation of new music internationally as opposed to saying, and you know, I'm by no means saying that one is more right than the other, but as opposed to saying, okay, we're only going to support music by American composers or composers living in America and so on. But this really has a very broad breadth to it as witnessed by the works that have been commissioned. So I, I wanted to make that point as well as another point, and that is what I think is one of the beauties of the situation, and that is that every application to, uh, for a commission is always uh, really a combined effort of a composer that is being commissioned by a specific performing organization. Yes. So it's not a case where you're saying, okay, a composer is applying for funds to, to write a work, but rather there is this uh, 
work together between performers and composers. Kusevitsky's motto really was, you write me music and I will play it. Then that isn't always what happens. You can commission a piece, but you can't guarantee it's going to be played. Kusevitsky played it, and he played them again and again. If the, if the Boston audiences had any complaint, it was that he was playing too much new music. Uh, and if they complained that he wasn't playing enough German music, of course. But it took him time to get catch up with Brahms and all of these other composers who Bostonians assumed were the heart and soul of Western music. And he was spending so much time learning these new pieces that he, it took him a little while to catch up with that. But he did that. And the idea that you commission regardless of nationality is very important too. And that's something that he shared with Elizabeth Spray Coolidge. She was pressured when she came here to, let's do it for the Americans. And she said, oh no, I'm no, uh, I'm no uh, fan of the Monroe Doctrine, as particularly <laughs> applying to music. We'll get the best, whether it's Hungarian or American or whatever. Yeah. No. Now, another feature of the, of the foundation, which I think is unusual, is that it, uh, it's independent of performing organizations. We, we partner with performing organizations through the commissioning process, but the, the uh, judges, the, the, the board itself, is, is not a performing group. It is not a, uh, a, a rich person who decides to com uh, fund a certain composer. Rather, we're an independent group of, of, uh, of distinguished composers and performers who, who perform this function. Um, and there, I think there's nothing quite like this, and certainly not on the scale uh, in America anyhow. It's actually the most fun part of the day is after we've d gone through all the applications and then there comes that fateful moment when we're all asked to give our numbers. <laughs> yeah, and, yes. and we go around the room and it's, Jim says, we're gonna start with so-and-so and go clockwise. Or this year we're gonna go anti-clockwise and start with so-and-so. And then you hear the numbers come up and that, and you is that what yeah, you gave? it goes from <laughs> nine to one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes for the same composer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was gonna, that's, I was even trying to imply that. Yeah. Democracy at work. Yeah. And the good ones usually win. And it's sometimes, yeah, I, I'm thinking, nobody's going to vote for this person. I really like them. But the, then everybody does. Yeah. yeah. That's great. So be it. Very satisfying. <laughs> this is another is question. Is the process always a pleasant one, or is there sometimes some arguing when you get down near the end? It, we do it by the numbers, actually. But there's a discussion along the way, but it's always friendly. Yeah. My, my, my job as chief of music was to be a fly on the wall. And it was enjoyable, indeed, to hear and to see. Uh, I never saw any arm twisting or even, you know, you think that or yeah, that, yeah. you know. It was absolutely uh, honest, and everything came out uh, honest, straight, no arm twisting, no nothing. It's very, very fair. Yeah, and fun too. It's also an education. It's it, constantly refreshing us with What's, what's going on around the world uh, once a year. It's, it's always, it's a wonderful experience. Yes, and some people know many composers, and even though there are always still new ones that come up that we're excited about and we haven't ever heard of before. So that, yeah. that's a tremendous uh, boost. The late Andrew Embry was, I think, the most vociferous in his argumentations, yes. in the discussions. Yeah. Boy. He well, I, I remember the, the time when, when he voted nine for a composer that I knew he hated. And it was at that point that I realized that he'd reversed the numbers. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I was wondering, I was wondering, um, you know, kind of the styles of music that are in vogue sometimes change. And in the 50s, there was a lot of interest in serial music. And now we've got minimalist music. And I wondered what the influence of that change in style might have been for you as judges? And also, the other slightly embarrassing question is, did you ever miss the boat with a composer where he didn't get a sort of got a no confidence vote, and then a few years later, he shows up as an important composer? Yes, and he probably gets a grant at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we've, had, we've had people who've been looked at more than once and with different results at different times. 
But in fact, there's a huge variety of, of choices uh, all, every year. It's, uh, I, I think it's really diverse, the way it comes out. And, and uh, of course, there are fads and fashions, and uh, things go up and down. But um, I, we try to look beyond that and, and just choose what we think is best. Yeah, music never stands still. It's always in, it's in a constant state of change all the time. And as Fred said, when we get scores, people are pretty savvy about looking at the scores and hearing the music and, and getting, this person's got something, it's not my thing, but we're going to vote for it anyway. And of course, in many cases, we know a lot about the composers who commissioned anyhow. So we're not, in some cases, we, we come in not knowing anything, but, but often we know a great deal before we listen. The, the, one, the one thing, excuse me, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Fundamentally, I think one of the basic things that makes this <clears throat> fundamentally, I said, I was saying, one of the things that makes this, I'll just speak, one of the things that makes this interesting, it was working. It was working. It was working. It was working. one of the things that makes this interesting is there's mutual respect for all the members of the, of the, of the, of the foundation. And that's very, very important because I think you recognize by listening to the the, the the review of one person, what they are dealing with, and how they see this piece, even though that piece may not be of the same style that you are, but you understand there's something important being communicated in this piece, and that's what ultimately art is all, all about, constantly transforming experience to a meaningful to, to a meaningful, so that it becomes meaningful to other people. And to be a part of this is important because you're learning how wide a range that is, and you're developing a greater respect for things that you know as well as things that you don't know. And that makes it an important experience for any creative artist. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's important. And a big it's very much in the spirit of Kusevitsky, who was a very fair person. He, he had a sort of arrogant side, but he, he built himself. Uh, he was a self-promoter of the, of the highest order. His, Rus his fellow Russians didn't like that. You know, in Russia, it's not so good to be a self-promoter. But he was out there vigorously promoting himself, but so that he could support these things that he believed in. And he was very, very open-minded. His, his commissions just show it. Uh, he was left and right and down the middle, and he didn't have any evident prejudices. He had fights with composers over various things, but he was, you know, he was one of Sibelius's greatest supporters. So, but we also have a wonderful letter from Sibelius saying to Kusevitsky, if you want to be a composer yourself, why don't you write your own music? Because <laughs> Kus Kusevitsky did take liberties. But it was a time in which the Ort text, the idea of doing things by the, by the book, what didn't exist yet. And so he did, you know, he did Beethoven in a very Russian way, and some people thought that was a bad taste or whatever. But he was brilliant. And one of the things that has been remarked often about Kusevitsky is his sense of tone color, his ear for color. He really got an orchestra to do things that nobody had ever heard before. Whether the composer heard it or wanted it is not so much the point, is that Kusevitsky was always exciting, always entertaining and educational at the same time. It, it, there's one regret that I've had, and I've been on this foundation since Aaron Copeland's days, so that's a long time ago. How many times we have wanted to listen to a certain thing more, and we had to say we, we just don't have the time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we listen to the first movement, uh, maybe two minutes and three minutes, and then somebody says, well, let's forward, you know, and. And then they say, well, how about listening to the last movement or something? And, and so many times we're frustrated that we just can't do it. But we have yeah. many great readers on the panel, people that can really read a score, which is a nice, it's a, well, a great true. bonus, of course. Yeah, sure, yeah. But that, that's been a, a continuing problem. That's just time, time and money. <laughs> yeah. But we do the best we can. Do you, do you, have you ever approached it in a, a blind? 
mind. I mean, the, like the compositions are presented and you don't know if it's a male or a female or their no. legacy or anything? No. You never have done that? No. Well, because we just, they come with a list and we're just we're going down the proposals. But at the beginning, everybody looks over the scores and we're all just leafing through the reading of it, trying to figure out what's going on. This is back here. I had a, a, a question that was stimulated by the previous comment and with all of the uh, committee members here, I'm wondering whether sort of part of uh, pr um, putting in the time to do something like this in addition to the sheer love of supporting new music is the secondary effect on the composers who form this committee and as you said, sometimes you hear things uh, or learn of people that you weren't aware of before. Can any of you comment on how it's affected your own composing by serving on this selection committee, if it has at all? I think it's, a, it, it's affected me mainly by broadening my knowledge of, of so much that's going on. And um, yeah. I mean, it happens in other places too, but this has certainly been one of the most important ones. Um, and it's invaluable. You, it, you, you want to know what's going on everywhere uh, in, in the composer world, because you're always uh, picking up new things and and getting ideas and finding it, even things you don't like. You know, you, you think about why you don't like something, and it helps you clarify your own thoughts. Also, there's another funny thing. I don't know if, if my fellow panelists will agree or not, but that the advent of the, the computer program that spits out the score is something that you don't get to see the handwriting anymore. And that, that part was, it's, it's kind of interesting because there can be a messy composer, but you see the, the intensity of how the music was written. Now it all looks the same, which is, I regret that part. I, that. I, I would regret it, except that it's so much easier. <laughs> It's so much easier for the players and the, and the conductor when you finally get to uh, perform the piece. But it does have an impact on the collection uh, because if there is no manuscript, what we have the composers do is to print out you know, a computer notated copy of the score and then initial every page and that's what's on deposit. But thinking you know, more broadly of what musicology will be in 50 years from now when there are no intermediate drafts of anything, or they're all stuck on somebody's unreadable hard drive or something like that. that, that it's a side issue to Kusevitsky, but it is a real well, one. I think com composers, at least I certainly do, my, many composers keep files of, of, of the pieces that goes along, uh, even, if, even if they compose directly into Sibelius or Finale. Well, just it's earlier, it's, they not, were it's not the same as a, as, a, as a handwritten sketch, but at least it's something. Yeah, no coffee stains. Earlier today, we were looking at, Loris brought the, uh, Milton Babbitt donated all of his uh, various things, sketches and, and manuscripts to the library, and we're just looking at the piece that I'm going to play tonight. And th there was there were some disputed areas of this piece where a student Milton said, "No, that clef is wrong," and so and but I liked the clef the way Milton wrote it first, and then we looked in the sketch and saw it's there from the very beginning. So I'm playing the treble clef tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How is our time doing? 20 hours. 20 hours. I know, but how? What, do, do, do people need to be let, let go at any point? I, I don't, didn't have any timeline for this, so I'd like to keep this going as long as we can, but I just don't want to run. You say five? Okay, you've got five precious minutes left. Well, the questions are so good, I can't imagine there are going to be some. Yeah. Please, please. please. Anybody else? Stunned silence. Yeah, no. Okay. Yes, right over here. here oh. I wonder if you could, I don't know if characterize is the right word, the, the current composers that you've been seeing rec recently. I mean, is there, is there something that strikes you or maybe over the last 10 years? I don't know, you know, I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if this is moving someplace, that's what I'm trying to understand. If what, yeah, it, uh, that's, we're in a period of, um, of multiple styles and that's been going on for quite a while. So uh, in a way, things don't change, just everything changes simultaneously. So in that sense, it, it, it doesn't change. However, I think there are certain trends that are, that are happening. More and more young composers are into microtones you know, smaller divisions of, of the octave than the 12 notes on, on the piano. Um, 
it's at, at my school where I teach, they all do it now. Um, there's, ever since Berlioz and Wagner, there's been an increasing interest in tone color as a dimension of musical structure and aesthetics, and that has become ever more important. So I, I know many young composers who care much less about pitch than they do about the tone color, timbre. Um, so th those are two developments that I don't even necessarily agree with in, a, in, all, in all respects, but it's happening. Isn't it a little bit like an amoeba? It sort of has all these arms that, that branch out of the composition scene and one goes way off of the side and then it gets isolated and then it's, it's cut off and it might leave something behind. After that happens. Another thing that's happening is that, is that people are using computers uh, all the time now, and they're composing not only to create the sounds, but also to help them build the materials. And there various kind, there's various software where you can model the sounds and then, then uh, orchestrate from the modeling that you did, things like that. So um, computers are, are very much part of the compositional process now. It's kind of like the old thing that a composer writes like he or she improvises up to a point that may be part of it, that the imagination and the way a composer improvises is also very closely related. I don't know if I, I'm, am I saying the wrong thing, Ollie? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, well, the, the, how you compose is it, you, get, you have different tools, you know. Uh, Copeland would compose at the piano, but now a composer will compose using some software. Um, and it, it, there are pluses and minuses no matter what. Uh, but you, the tool that you use is going to affect what, what the result is. So you have to, a, a good composer knows that and knows how to deal with that. I had a question uh, about your procedure in the very near future. I understood perhaps from your comments that you don't actually uh, study the scores beforehand when you go into that room tomorrow. That's your first time to, to see and, and mentally hear these scores or, or hear uh, performances of these scores. Yes. But these guys are good. I just say that, I mean, I, I, every single one of them, they look and you can, you can feel the wheels turning upstairs and the sounds coming through mentally. So do you expect to be looking at 30 scores or 50 or, or five tomorrow? I don't know how many, are, are, Kate, how many? It's usually around 50. Thank you. But at the beginning, there's always a, pl a place where, don't we, oh, excuse me, go ahead, Kate, because we break them up into groups. Oh, I, no, I was just going to, when, when you're done talking, I'm going to say something else. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, at the beginning of the whole process, there's however many of us there are, we take the number of scores and divide it by the number of panelists, and we each take that, that number of scores and study them. So we don't all study all the scores at the beginning, and then we discuss what we've read, and we've made, we make recommendations where they should go on the process or be terminated at that point. And then if anybody has any you know, doubts about it, we go back and we look at the scores again. But it's, it's, that's why, as John was saying, it's a very good process. It's, it's been worked out over time to be, it's not foolproof, but it's But you know, in an, in an ideal world, uh, we would spend a week doing this, but nobody has a week to do it. Um, so we do the best we can in the, in the time that we have. I just want to say thank you, all of you, for being here and for your wonderful comments. And I want to point out that um, in, in the foyer of the Coolidge Auditorium, we have a wonderful display, a very special display tonight of commissioned manuscripts, including the Bartok Concerto. So please, we hope that you will linger there and look at what we've got. So thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.